So online grocery, we've, uh, we've all seen it. It's been around for 25 years. Uh, early on, uh, Portland was one of the centers for online grocery. Um, but for a lot of years, it's really has grown slowly step by step until now. Uh, the last data that I've seen is that Albertsons reports for the last quarter that online sales are up 276%. Uh, in my world, that's a big increase. Um, so I think, and what do we call this? We call this an omni-channel world. People may argue about the name, but the idea is how do we get the product in front of consumers 24 seven in the way that they like to, like to shop uh, and which is changing as well. So today we have one of the country's leading experts, the man who wrote the book on Omnichannel, Lionel Binney with us to share with us his thoughts on Omnichannel. Fantastic, and, and I just wanna uh, uh, maybe, and anyone can jump in on this, do we all agree with what our good friend Kevin Coop said last week, which is, Tom just laid out the scenario, Safeway going direct to consumer uh, through e-com is omni-channel. If Safeway were to sell through Amazon to the consumer, not omni-channel. Is I, that? I would agree with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and the yeah. whole idea is, uh, well, I mean, it's omni-channel or consumer direct. He, was, he wasn't saying omni-channel, he was saying consumer direct. Yeah, right, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, if there's no one in between you, then it's a uh, consumer, consumer consumer direct. Right. And to me, the, the key factor is who's owning the relationship with the consumer. Yeah. Uh, and the person, the company, the organization that owns the consumer relationship uh, is the one that's um, usually wins in the long run. So with that great explanation then, omni-channel does mean we can go to Amazon, we can go through our own, we can do, we can offer it through this service. We can, go ahead, someone give their spin on all that's involved with Omnichannel. So, so for me, Omnichannel is all of the above. Omnichannel is making the product available 24 seven, not just the product, but information about the product. It's looking at the consumer decision journey from start to, uh, to buying to, experiencing it and looking at all what all the key touch points along the way that make that work. And really the key points, I think is uh, what Lionel talks about is uh, customer information and interaction, uh, search, and then fulfillment. And Omnichannel is making it avail products available 24 seven services as well uh, to consumers through all of the above. Fantastic. And then one last question I have before we get into Lionel, and that's of Dave, because we all love Tillamook. We have been already doing work with Tillamook, and we're going to do an end project with Tillamook. Dave, give us an understanding of how you discuss Omni opportunities with Tillamook. <laughs> yeah, great question, Craig. Yeah, I, I would say of, of any platform, you have to see it through the lens of that visual of the consumer that's at the shelf and any route to get to that consumer. And in the Tillamook world is whether they go direct right to the consumer, that is a, an option, but through the, through the other different types of channels that they can sell products to, it's, it's thinking through what are the different options how can you how in other words going back to how a bill becomes a law how does that product go from the the farm uh, out to some form of channel to supply the goods to the consumer outside of direct to consumer think through those different options and what impact they would have for the company for the brand for the companies along that supply chain and then to the end consumer, what do they gain through that relationship? That's what you should be looking for as you're going through these individual, but really the team projects. I'll challenge each of, your, each of the teams to have that discussion and debate about what is the most optimum for the products and the brands they're representing for Tillamook. Excellent, excellent and good. And we will go right 
to Lionel, but first I got to leave Sid with something to think about while Lionel talks. And that is, when does Pivotal Tools become an omni-channel category management tool where all the data is aggregated <laughs> from everywhere into Pivotal Tools? Don't have to answer that yet, Sid, but I'm going to come back to that at the end after we hear from Lionel, because I think you have a hell of an opportunity to put it bluntly, <laughs> just to say so. Thank you for that challenge. <laughs> all right, well, let's go off to Lionel and uh, we'll come back afterwards and have a, a hearty discussion about what we learned. Today, we're welcoming Lionel Benny. Uh, one of the topics that we wanted to explore with the course is omnichannel. Uh, and this has become particularly a uh, hot topic today is going direct to consumer and, and how does omnichannel fit into a direct to consumer along with a traditional store model. And so why not go to the guy who wrote the book on omnichannel? So we're really pleased to have Lionel here. Uh, Lionel is going to give us kind of a, a quick tour of some of the things that he's covered in the book. And if he looks familiar, you did see in the uh, day one assignment that uh, there's an optional uh, assignment looking at Lionel's book as part of the class. So um, Lionel, I'm just going to turn it over to you. OK, well, thank you. Yeah, so I. Um... Uh, I'll go over some slides shortly just to give a quick synopsis of the book. But um, yeah, I've been working in um, consumer products, uh, wholesale and retail for at least 20 years and inside companies and in the last 12 years as a consultant. And my, my basic role was to, I call it channel marketing, but it's basically, it's a sort of a blend of go to market strategy and also execution product companies that want to get on store shelves or they want to uh, broaden their reach in some way. I've also done it for restaurants that want to get new locations. So it's a blend of uh, getting into stores and also expanding physical distribution. And uh, I, so I, over the last few years, I have, I started to think deeply about uh, what is really happening with e-commerce and I felt that there was propaganda on both sides. You know, there was a lot of biased opinions from the tech folks saying, yeah, Amazon will take everything and, you know, there will never be another shopping mall or a valid retail shop ever, you know, which seemed to me a ridiculous oversimplification of how people live their lives. And then the, uh, but the only defense was coming from sort of fairly frantic and fearful, you know, shopping mall type people and the Walmarts and the Macy's folks, you know, like also giving, you know, a defense of what they do, but not very confidently. And I realized there was very little content about omni-channel out there. And, um, so I just thought I got to I have to answer this for myself to see if you know what's really happening in 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 the world of retail, and so I just yeah I did a lot of secondary research. It's all basically reading, tons of blog posts I read, a lot of books. I found all the thought leaders, uh, or you know a lot of the thought leaders in the space, people like Paco Underhill, um, who wrote Why We Buy. He's a really great guy. Um, he actually endorsed my book. And um, so, you know, the psychology of shopping. So anyway, um, that's why I wrote the book. And because uh, I wanted to find out, you know, to what extent is e-commerce going to take over retail and in what categories and why? And then what, what do we still value about physical shopping? 
and what is a valid role for stores and malls going forward. Um, and because we're now at a point where we can kind of see the future. Um, it's been very muddled in the last 10, 15 years, but I think we're now at a point, and I know COVID is muddying the waters to some extent, but you know, we, we kind of, we know it's muddying the waters, but we hope that it's a short term situation. Um, I believe it's a medium to short term situation that will, you know, in a micro sense, affect the long term trend, you know, the secular trend um, of what's happening with retail. So that's, you know, that's the summary. Great. Excellent. Well, that, I mean, that's, a, that's a, a great setup. And the students, of course, are completely knowledgeable about what's happening due to, as you just called it, the COVID effect, that e comm is going through the roof, that people uh, who had never been predisposed or even had a desire to order online, even those who used to still fear about giving their credit card up, have suddenly relied on um, uh, e, e com to deliver to their front door so they don't have to shop. And of course, uh, I've heard from many of them, I hear the same thing, man, it's like Christmas, a box arrives every day. They didn't even care if it's toilet paper. It was just really great. Yeah. But we, we also know that the racial breakdown has changed rather, the racial and ethnic breakdown has changed to where groups that previously were not predisposed are now purchasing online, maybe due to the COVID effect. And the question is always, will that change? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, you know, but I mean, yes, I, totally. I mean, I've, I've read, you know, I continue to read and follow this space and blog about it and, and follow people. Um, yeah, I mean, all the numbers are up for e-commerce and, you know, buying things they never thought they would buy online, like toilet paper or dog food or cans of soup. Yeah, all of the numbers are up for sure. But I mean, what I find interesting is that, the, so, so now we're in a situation where we can order anything online and we are, but why aren't we happy with that? So what is it, why are we still itching to get out of our house then, right? right. To, go to, to go to places where they have restaurants and shops. To go right? to the store, yeah. So oh, in other words, we should be thrilled and super satisfied with our situation, which is living in our little box and ordering everything, but so why aren't we happy? We're not happy because it's damn boring. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and it's interesting the number of brands that maybe started off as pure online who have started opening um, retail, you know, retail bricks and mortar as well. I think uh, Warby Parker, uh, you know, Amazon is certainly growing their retail presence. And um, so there's an interesting dynamic. I also think it's interesting is uh, how new brands, because it's if you're a brand new brand, getting on the shelf can be a challenge, and more than a challenge, it can be expensive uh, in distribution. And if you can establish yourself online, uh, yeah. it also sort of opens up some opportunities to have more of a um, traditional bricks and mortar or omnichannel uh, along with your online business, which I think is it's an interesting dynamic to have both. Exactly. Yeah, no, the, the conclusion of my book was that, you know, omni-channel is, is the correct word. I mean, some people don't like that terminology because they think it's jargon, but it's not jargon. I actually thought long and hard about whether I should use the word omni-channel as the title of my book. But my publisher and I decided that it was the right term. We did a lot of uh, Google Analytics and, you know, search research. You know, people are using that search term a lot. So whether you, you like that term or not, it is the right term, I think, um, for the fact that, yeah, people, um, people will start discovering online, they'll do their initial research online, then they'll do further research in stores for a high ticket item, just so they could talk to a salesperson, and they might go back online, and then maybe they'll end up ordering it online and picking it up in the store. So, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's very convoluted how people are, you know, you do your research in multiple ways. And in my book, um, I should probably do the slides because that way I can, the theoretical concepts will be more clear. But basically it depends on the product and the buying occasion. You know, in other words, for a very low 
expectation product that I call mundane products. Like a classic example is like a cell phone charger um, or a pair of tube socks. So it's very low stakes. You know, you're not too worried about it. It's not very high ticket. You're super comfortable buying it on the internet, right? Because you kind of know what you'll get. And if it's slightly wrong, you don't even care. So those, those types of, you know, convenience, um, mundane, uh, everyday purchases for simplistic products, you know, and that would include CPGs like dog food or, you know, laundry detergent or house, you know, pasta even, anything shelf stable could be termed a mundane product um, in that sense. And in my book, I have a little four quadrant chart that, sh that divides, that divides up, um, that analyzes product categories uh, by how conducive they are to buying online. Now, it's theoretical. I would love to like do Nielsen research to validate it. Okay, so this is just a quick synopsis, a few slides covering some of the big themes of my book, you know, the wider themes. Um, so that's the title, uh, The Future of Omnichannel Retail. This is actually a talk I gave to a, um, it was a community sort of development type organization. So they're all concerned about the implications of losing, you know, retail in their town. Um, that's why, that's just the title, everything else is, quite relevant. Um, okay, next slide, please. So that's, yeah, we can, that's just, I guess, buy my book on Amazon. Just take a moment, pop your book. Come on, here's your chance, Lionel. It's only $13.99 for the physical. And you get the Kindle version for eight bucks. So yeah. cool. look yeah. at it. it's five star reviews. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there you go. It now has, it now has 28 reviews. Um, ah, okay. Excellent. Uh, just in all honesty, the, the book did it, it won an award, actually. Um, the Florida Authors and Publishers Association uh, gave me a, a, a business book award last year. Oh, and cool. um, it's been picked up by actually f at least four other colleges to use to teach business students. St. Catharines in Minnesota, uh, Mississippi State, uh, Bowling Green State, Fordham University. Um, so business teachers have found the book online and, and used it. And there may be more that I don't even know of. Yeah. Um, so uh, why all malls look the same? This is kind of an amusing aside, but relevant. Uh, Victor Gruen is the fellow down on the bottom left there. He was the Austrian architect that designed the first enclosed shopping mall that was in uh, Adena, Minnesota in 1954. And uh, the reason all the malls in America look the same is because everyone copied his design, much to his annoyance. He got really angry towards the end of his career because people had mimicked his design of a mall without integrating it into the communities properly and just surrounding with acres of parking lots. So he actually wanted what malls are probably going to have to go back to, which is like having, you know, libraries and schools and, and parks and cultural. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he wanted that from the start. But the, these shopping mall developers like Simon and uh, Rouse and Taubman and everybody, they just mimicked this design of, you know, four department stores, uh, potted plants and fountains in the middle, two levels, escalators, you know, uh, and, um, you know, but they were, it was the original mall was a complete breakthrough and a massive innovation, but it got basically overused. Okay, next, please. Um, so this is to the, the <clears throat> what I, through the book uh, research, I, I came to the conclusion that there's two, and other people have validated this, there's two basic functions of shopping if you want to really break it down, discovery and fulfillment. So discovery is, is the research that you do to decide what you want to buy. And then fulfillment means actually the, the transaction. So before the internet, those two functions were completely merged. You know, you went to the store to discover what you wanted to buy and then you bought it. 
Um, I mean, maybe you read consumer reports or did some research, but for the most part, you went to the store and you relied on the salesperson's advice and the store packaging to tell you what you wanted to buy. But the internet has broken those two things down so, so that the discovery aspect, you know, it can be separate from the fulfillment aspect. So what that means to stores is that stores now, you know, the name, the store is uh, literally means, you know, it used to be a storehouse. In other words, you went to the store because that's where stuff was, right? It was all stacked up at the general store. So, you know, that's what the store used to be. But now <clears throat> that aspect of distribution of actually getting a product, you know, can come from a warehouse. It comes from Amazon or it comes, it might come from a store in terms of buying, you know, getting an order from a local target or something. But um, so basically discovery can happen on online or it can happen in the store and fulfillment obviously can happen online or in the store. Um, and the, the internet has broken this up so that consumers can decide, you know, how they want to play this um, and do everything online or only partially online. Okay, next please. So um, I built this model of, um, and this is the homogeneous products and heterogeneous products. Uh, I guess I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but this is just from marketing textbooks on the types of, uh, basically there's all these models about how, um, how to think about different types of consumer products and, and how they're bought. So there's like shopping goods and there's convenience goods and there's specialty goods and there's unsought goods. So, you know, a, mark, a, a big marketing textbook will usually have a section on this. Um, but uh, if you could go to the next slide. So yeah, I've got, so I built a four quadrant axis. So the first axis was the homogeneous heterogeneous and that just means homogeneous basically means products that are the same as each other. Um, like going back to that cell phone charger example, you know, a basic cell phone charger is pretty simple. Uh, it might be the Apple one or it might be a, a, a generic knockoff. Um, but they're mass produced, they're basically the same at a certain level. Whereas heterogeneous products, you know, the big, the most clear example could be natural products like gross, like food, like avocados or apples. I mean, they're all unique, obviously. Um, or, you know, even apparel. You know, um, you know, it might have unique, uh, th there might be small differences in the product quality, like the, the type of buttons that are used or the texture of the material. Um, and another example would be like furniture, you know, anything made out of natural materials, like a, a wooden coffee table, you know, the grain is going to be different in each one. Right. So you, if you want to buy a really nice coffee table, yeah, you might order it on Wayfair and not care, you know, if it's really what you thought it was. But if you're really spending a lot of money and you care about these kinds of things, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a unique product with a, with, a, with a unique, it might be handcrafted or it might just have natural uh, differences like wood grain or texture, and you want to go see it in person. So that's heterogeneous. Um, and then this axis is the low engagement to high engagement, which basically it has a lot to do with the price. So like uh, a high engagement product would be a house or a car, you know, very expensive long term purchase, but not necessarily because um, like some people, if you're a home chef, you know, you care a lot about the ingredients of the food that you order and you want to go check it out. So you do care a lot about it. So that's high engagement. And then low engagement would be something that you don't care that much about, back to the cell phone charger, or you know, something that you view as generic, like possibly pet food or you know, canned soup, something that's very low stake stakes. Okay, next please. So then yeah, that puts the two the, the low, that puts the two axes together here. And then next please. 
And then I, I labeled each of these axes. So the bottom left quadrant are these mundane products like basic clothes, like tube socks, or a phone charger, or a can of soup that you're very comfortable ordering online. So this, the purpose of this grid is to sort of, it's just a way to think about what types of products are more, are likely to continue to further to go online and which types of products and shopping occasions are likely to resist, you know, being purchased completely online. Um, so, uh, can I ask a question here? I, of I'm course. At the upper left-hand part of this high engagement uh, homogenous, and I see a Patek Philippe. Yeah. Which I don't, you know, at least in my mind, is not a sort of a homogenous product. Um, yeah. So how, how does that? Why is that a highly homogenous same product? Um, I understand. Well, I, I totally agree with high engagement. There's there's an hedonic uh, value, but hom homogeneous. Yeah. Well, you know, it's I I actually revisited these concepts recently. I mean, actually, a couple of days, a couple of weeks ago, because I'm writing a blog post about this. I mean, technically, um, the there's different. <clears throat> I mean, the short answer is that it's mass produced. So let's, I mean, I actually did research Patek Philip because they're the most high-end Swiss watch brand. Um, so, you know, but, and they, they all have serial numbers, right? So if you buy a certain type of Patek Philip watch, you know, the 2020 edition, um, it's not interchangeable in that people don't care about it, but it is interchangeable. But, but the point is that if you knew that you were buying a particular Philip watch and you wanted to order it online from a jeweler and you'd done all your research, you, you know, you, you would know what it is. Um, in other words, you would be very satisfied that you would get that actual item and that, and that, uh, um, because it's mass produced. In other words, it's not an avocado or it's not an antique table, which is completely the yeah uniqueness. okay yeah so would you and, put uh like a 1957 rolex they don't make anymore over in the unique high engagement heterogeneous product whereas one of them is actually brand new the other one is like hey this just doesn't exist unless you find it on ebay or through a auction house well that's yeah no that's a great example because like vintage clothing is a huge thing now um, and people love vintage clothing because it's very, it's in the top right corner. It, like, let's say you get an old pair of Levi's, you know, vintage Levi's. Yeah. Now, yeah. you know, when they were manufactured, they were much more homogeneous, but now they've worn in a certain way. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's really unique and you want to buy it because it, it just says to the world that like, I have the only pair that is like this. So I, I love this quadrant because I, you know, I would put a brand new drum kit, being a drummer, or a brand new Les Paul guitar, like you see hanging on the wall, in the elite category. But I would put a 1957 Les Paul or a Ludwig Vistalite drum kit uh, in the yeah. unique because you can't get them. You can't buy them. When you get them, you cherish them. <laughs> Right. And that, right. And that's part of the purchase experience. Yeah. So going to vintage record shops or vintage, you know, clothing shops or music equipment shops, you know, that cannot be replaced online. But back to Tom's question, I mean, I think the particular Philip, yeah, if it's a new one and you trust the, the jeweler and you've done your research, you're going to, I think you're kind of, in that sense, it's homogeneous because you know exactly what you're going to get. It is that one, it's the 2020 Patek Philip with the, you know, it's got a serial number, you know what you're going to get, and it's mass produced. I mean, not in huge quantities, but you don't necessarily need to go see it and touch it, is the point. Um, but by the way, you know, to be in all honesty, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I know this is just a model and it does, it's not completely watertight. Um, <laughs> Well, that's no, a, a, a great way to make you think about things. So I'm, yeah. I'm 
good with this. Yeah, you literally could put that very special patik fill up like I would love to have over the unique because it doesn't exist except someone owns it and you've got to purchase it from them. So it moves from the 2020 version is in the elite, but the, uh, the, the 1960 version is in the unique. Yeah. And, and for our students, I would just point out that I think it's really cool to build a map like this off of two dimensions to describe some concepts that you have. So hint, hint, if you're doing a project in a class, uh, <laughs> there's a way that you can develop something like this. I mean, I really nerded out on these charts and I've been reading, I've actually been studying about the, the power, it's called cognitive uh, shortcuts. There's a high value to uh, infographics because they give you a cognitive shortcut. In other words, to explain these concepts in writing, you'd have to read, you know, you'd have to read 30 pages. Um, and my book does provide those words. Yeah. But there's a whole science of like, you know, like really well thought out infographics are amazing learning tools. Um, it's very powerful. So um, I, I, you know, I really enjoy these kind of conceptual models that, it, you know, like it's a cognitive shortcut. It's like, oh, wow. So, and then the bottom right corner is art, you know, I thought pretty hard with my publisher and editor about these labels, but we kind of ended, I think we kind of like them. Um, they're not perfect, but artisan could be, it's, it's lower stakes like an avocado or some, a piece of cheese. Um, it's truly unique. I mean, you could order it online, but you're probably going to want to check it out. Um, you know, are they homogeneous or heterogeneous? You know, the, to some extent they're, some people say that an apple, <clears throat> like a, you know, a, a golden delicious apple is, is homogeneous. I mean, I've, I've, you know, in other words, they're interchangeable, but for, if you're a chef or you're really into food, you know, you don't want anyone else picking up your apples. So, um, you know, that, that bottom right quadrant is also a mix of the two. Okay, next please. And then this just, that's just a repeat really without the quadrants labeled. Um, okay, next please. And then this, this goes to this con these two concepts. There's a guy called Joseph Pine who wrote um, a book called The Experience Economy. And he's a very good thinker about how the economy has evolved from like um, basic resources like food and lumber and oil and the more advanced economies that we live in now are essentially experience economies. So people, you know, we, we've all heard about this, people buy experiences, not products. So the, this attempts to, and he came up with these two labels of time well spent and time well saved. So the idea is that shopping for these more sort of elite, unique experiential products is itself an experience that we cherish so that would be somebody going to an antique fair or, or Powell's books would be a perfect example. You know, to browse used books um, is time well spent, it's fun. You know, it's not transactional. And then the bottom left quadrant is time well saved. So we are very, very happy to save ourselves shopping to the store to buy, you know, cans of cat food and, you know, paper towels or things that we, you know, we, are, we love Amazon because it saves us time and, you know, the, and, and that's very valid. So, I mean, massive amounts of the internet are going here, e-commerce. And I would say that the COVID tie-in, you know, it's not just time well spent, but it's sort of safety. You know, in other words, we are very, very happy to save ourselves trips to the store to buy uh, products that would just be a chore to buy. So the, you know, this is sort of getting into how people think about shopping. Okay, next please. And this is actually the last slide and it just, that's time well spent and it's also social. So we often view shopping, you know, for these sort of um, uh, elite and, and unique and artisan products as fun and we do it socially with our family and friends. But we're but when we can sit on our couch with our laptop and order things, we're very happy to save time. 
So that's, you know, that sort of ties it all together. And that, that is, that, that's it for the slides. Okay, I'll no. uh, I, I've got a question, but Tom, if you've got one, go ahead. No, no, I was just uh, cutting okay. the slides. So, um, Lionel, I, one, I love quadrant systems. I, I don't want to detract from what we're doing here. I explained to you what we do at KO based on the or, entire organic market to help people understand we had to do that. So I love that. And I'm, I'm going to go back and focus on this. I'm going to use your quadrant. Thank you for that. Um, but I thought for our students' benefit, having such an omni-channel expert, it would be, hey, at 14 years old, I was a box boy at Thriftway. And when I was 14 years old, which is a long time ago, it was a retail grocery store where you went to get anything. Maybe the, the only kind of convenience store, there were no 7-Elevens or anything like that. You just went to the grocery store, that was it. Or there was a little home stand where we all went to get penny candy. That was pretty much it. Um, today, there's this omni-channel experience. I think it would be helpful if you can explain to the students what happened. When, when, when retail grocery stores began to be challenged by other channels, can you lay a baseline of really what's out there in omni-channel, how many channels there are of mm -hmm. choices for the consumer, kind of baseline, even pre-COVID, where, where we really sit? Well, yeah, I mean, omni-channel, <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, it's also that word is used for marketing, as, as in like, you know, radio, TV, billboards, you know, coupons, Facebook. So I'm not using it in that sense. I'm, I'm using it in the sense of retail, um, you know, which is, you know, the other sense in which omni-channel is used. So, but I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, well, in my book, there's a whole, I just, I do the whole history of retail, like a lightning tour from, you know, the, um, post, let me just look at the chart, because it's, um, but, uh, so initially, um, you know, the initial, I don't know if this is exactly going to your question, but I'll throw this out there and then you can ask further if you want, but, so basically, you know, the early markets of the, uh, you know, the bazaars and the souks uh, of uh, North Africa and Asia, which still exist, and the Greek agora and the Roman, the ancient Romans had out, had outdoor markets. And then the medieval farmers markets, so the market towns of Europe, where people brought in, you know, all the farmers brought in um, products, you know, on the, on the weekends and uh, during the fairs. Um, that was, there's a whole history of how the medieval um, fair days, which were usually coincided with religious holidays, um, and, you know, how, the, how commerce happened around those fairs and festivals. Um, but anyway, just speeding forwards, we got department stores that developed in the 1860s, uh, Bon Marché in France was one of the first. And then catalogs started with Sears in the 1890s. And, um, and then, then we go to the shopping mall example of the, the architect we mentioned earlier. First mall was 1954. And then big box stores came up in the 80s. You know, Walmart was the Amazon of its day. Everyone hated Walmart because they were putting Main Streets out of business in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and they were killing the malls and the main streets. And then, um, then home shopping. Home shopping was, you know, that, I, I don't know the size of the home shopping market. I'm talking about TV shopping, UBC. Um, but that was big and it still exists. And then the internet. But I mean, in terms of, so, but in terms of like what channels are there, whether, whether there are all these retail formats, you know, I just mentioned, you know, malls, big box stores, uh, downtowns, and um, department stores, and all these sort of classic retail formats. Um, and then, of course, there's e-commerce. Um, but I don't think I've got the, I don't think I've gotten the gist of your question exactly. Um, well, I wanted to hear something like omni-channel. Yeah. You know we're talking about more than one channel or more than one opportunity for you to buy basically the same product. 
Uh, that's yeah. essentially uh, right. what I'm talking about. But I actually am glad you went where you are because I think you point out something very, very unique. The bazaars or farmers markets of old are now one of the hottest things of today. Um, yeah. The grocery stores we thought were all going to disappear, as you said earlier, um, are not only still here, they're becoming more and more relevant to the consumer and kind of dialing in down the funnel to where they really belong and what purpose they serve. And they're very distinguished. A Safeway is drastically different than a Whole Foods, which is different than even a New Seasons uh, or uh -huh. in a market of choice here in this market where it says, hey, here's your Kellogg's Corn Flakes, put some organic locally grown strawberries on them. Um, you know, those are still there. The malls are still there. Um, as we look to and what everyone thought Amazon was going to do, well, there goes the grocery stores. Everything will be gone. Everything will be, oh, Amazon bought Whole Foods. Now everything's going to be gone. It's just going to be. Yeah. Uh, and of course, everything still exists. And even Walmart, I remember it well. Towns across America were saying, no Walmart. They're protesting because they thought yeah. the local hardware store would shut down. And what happened? The local hardware store got very hip and very relevant to a consumer group so that there was a reason to go to Walmart, but there was an even a better reason to go to the local hardware store. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, right. So, I mean, each channel has its validity, validity and, and <clears throat> it's, it's, I think uh, one, I think the best, one of the best ways to think about this is that time well spent, time well saved thing. Because it's not just the product, it's like your frame of mind when you need it. You know, are you buying something because you need it and, and you just want to solve that problem? Or do you want to go out and reward yourself with a shopping trip? You know, and you might buy the same thing on each trip, but your, your mind is different because you're rewarding yourself or you're solving a, a chore. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a, it's really an interesting way to look at that. And I think you talked a bit about this in terms of the process of discovery, of fulfillment, which, uh, you know, comes, you know, those are issues both on the vendor side as long with the consumer side. And I think coupling that with is what you're talking about now, what is the benefit that you get? Um, yeah. And is there a benefit as a social benefit, you know, that I get? Is there a benefit that com is, you know, comes from the experience uh, of, right. uh, using shopping is there a benefit that's more of a functional benefit that comes from just acquiring the product and you know from point a from point b and i think is when we think about go to market strategies um people have different needs and if i think about food in omnichannel i mean we can buy food everywhere today right bed bath and beyond sells food yeah uh, ikea sells food there's a food court in ikea i mean I, I challenge people to find a retailer that doesn't have some kind of food. Um, yeah, and also like putting like putting a coffee bar in a clothing store, for example, that's a big thing. Uh, putting a coffee bar in a Chase Manhattan Bank branch in Manhattan, they just did that. So blending, you know, uses like that, you know. So in other words, make the way to make a, a shopping experience fun is to add a coffee bar and sell some specialty food, you know. Um, so there's many sort of blended models that are, that are happening. I wanted to just talk about the direct-to-consumer thing a little bit, because I think that is a huge, like I, as I was preparing for the call, I did a couple of things click for me. I, I, read, an article, I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about mayonnaise uh, the other day, and I thought to myself, man, I haven't had mayonnaise for quite a while. Uh, I know it's not healthy or whatever, but who cares? It tastes good. <laughs> so I went down to Fred Meyer. We live near Fred Meyer, and that's where we shop. And I went, to, I checked out the mayonnaise, and I was really shocked because there was no Hellman's mayonnaise on the shelf. I mean, they weren't stocking it. It wasn't empty. They just weren't carrying it. What's that? Best food. Well, it's, it's all the same mayonnaise. In the East Coast, it's Hellman's. Yes. In the West Coast, it's Best Foods. Yes. Great branding experience for you to learn because rarely does this ever happen where the exact same product carries two different names, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Best Foods, Hellman's. So I bought the Kroger brand mayonnaise. So you're saying that is, that's Hellman's made that? 
Uh, I'm not saying Hellman's made that, but I will tell you this, having designed Kroger's naturally preferred brand, I can tell you that often in the yeah. hygiene artisan, artisan brands, especially yeah. naturally preferred or something, um, I can tell you this, the potato chips that were called naturally preferred were kettle chips sitting right next to the kettle chips, which were both super premium brands. So it's very oh, okay. possible that your Kroger branded mayonnaise could have been Hellman's, but they actually call the brand Hellman's on the East Coast and they call it best foods here on the West Coast. But what I notice is that they're not carrying Hellman's. They're carrying, they're, they're only carrying Kroger brand mayonnaise and, and one other brand I hadn't heard of, which really shocked me. Um, and then, and then, best foods? You, what's didn't, that? you didn't see best foods mayonnaise? As I a, might have seen it. That might have been that might Hellman's. have been the brand. That is yeah. Hellman's. Okay. Under a different brand name. I see. On the West Coast. Okay. Well, and then the other thing that clicked for me is that <clears throat> I read that um, Pepsi is now selling direct to consumer. So Pepsi, you know, snacks. They've, they've created a website, and this is completely in response to COVID. It's called PantryShop.com. And it's uh, that you can buy like a, a package of mixed snacks and, and drinks for 49 bucks. The Pepsi is, is selling, is shipping boxes of snacks and drinks to people. And they got that up and running in 30 days in response to COVID. So there's an example of a brand that you would normally expect to see in a retailer that's gone direct to consumer. And then I my sort of tie-in was that I assumed that Kroger had decided that they didn't need Hellman's, but you know I may be wrong there because of the best brand thing. But um, but you know, in other words, they're very competent. Notwithstanding, at least half of the mayonnaise display was the Kroger brands. They had the natural one and the olive oil one and the you know a couple of other variants, all Kroger branded. So you know, in other words, the retailer is doing private label, and the brand is selling direct to consumer, bypassing the retailer. So that's another example of the disruption of like, you know, brands and retailers, the line between brands and retailers is blurred big time. Boundaries pretty much everywhere are blurring. Uh, and yeah. I think this is a really, I think a really interesting dynamic as we look at who are your competitors and, and it really, you know, goes back to, I like this model of sort of understanding the consumer, I talk about the consumer decision journey. And, yeah. and that really, you know, integrates the concepts that you talked about of discovery, uh, discovery, awareness of a need. Uh, how do you get information and educate yourself about what option is best? And uh, then the fulfillment is, you know, how do I make it easy to buy? And, um, and then it comes all down to what is our experience? Uh, with uh, with our with our choice yeah yeah ultimately it's subjective it's like you know how do we right how do we feel about it and i like this concept i mean i've got um you know as a consultant i'm i'm sort of sharpening up my practice and and trying to appeal to clients who might have this issue like retailers which is that if you go back to the quadrant idea you know the way you the way uh <clears throat> And of course, this is nothing new. They are doing this, but grocery retailers, they need to capitalize on the, on the products that people want to come in and handle, like avocados and tomatoes. And then if the packaged goods that they could buy online quite easily are only three aisles over, why wouldn't they just go and pick up the stuff from the center aisle that they could, they could sure, they could have ordered paper towels online, but if you're going, if you regularly go to the grocery store to enjoy, you know, interacting with fresh foods and picking stuff out, why not just walk over and pick up your uh, central packaged goods because you're there anyway? And so I think in that sense, I had a, a dialogue with another retail consultant about this and, you know, like, because these people are trying to anticipate the future of retail. And I said, but yeah, but as long as people want to go pick out avocados and, and sample cheese in person, which they will forever, then the, what they're always going to be able to go over and pick up a, uh, a box of pasta. Right? I mean, in other words, those things will always happen in the same place. 
So spices, I, 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 go ahead. I, no, I'm dying to ask a question, but you go ahead and finish, and I want to ask my question on, on that. Subject. Well, I was, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to like really like look. If we look long term, like there's never going to be a time when people don't want to buy fresh food and fruits, right? Ever. Right. You don't want people, you know, stuffing broccoli in a box and shipping it. To you. Yeah. I mean, some people will, but sometimes, but basically you, you know, you just don't want that kind of experience. So the, the validity of fresh food and farmer's markets and really interesting restaurants and local food is never going to go away. But, um, but, you, but one of the things that I was surprised when we had an early online grocer in Portland, uh, you know, 20 years ago, that was actually a little ahead of its time. It got bought by Webvan and went away, Webvan went away. Uh, and what they found, I thought was really interesting, was that the consumers loved, loved, loved their produce. Everybody thought that produce would be the piece that everybody wanted to pick out themselves, but they put a lot of energy into doing a really good job of picking quality produce for you. And I think um, in the UK, Orcado has, at least initially, was doing the same and the sales of fresh produce were like one of the top selling items on this online, pure online grocer. So I, there's another component to that that I don't fully understand, but it, it looks like it's a trust factor. If you do a really good job at curating, um, yeah. maybe you can moderate that need to actually have that physical experience and interaction with the product. Yeah, I don't, yeah, no, I don't, I totally d agree, uh, you know, that, that there you know, certain types of people who are very busy, you know, uh, and highly paid, you know, the, they are quite happy to delegate, you know, shopping to people and to services. So, and maybe if you're, you know, retired or you're housebound or you have young kids, you know, like when you have, you know, I have three kids, but they're adults, young adults now. But I mean, when they were small, I mean, you would do anything to not drag them to the store. So, you yeah. know, to, so like certain times of people's lives, you know, delegating all shopping, yeah, to a service, including your avocados and tomatoes, it makes sense. Um, maybe I have too much time on my hands. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's, that's where I wanted to follow up, not on the time on their hands, but um, so the students had just heard from Sid Hannigan and Sid took them through category management and they learned that dairy, especially milk, is a routine category. That's in category management, it's called routine. That's the role that it plays. But we didn't go into the fact that milk is always in the very back of the retail store for the same reasons that you were just explaining, Lionel, about, well, people will come in for this and while they're there, they'll pick up that. Why is milk at the very back of the store? Because everybody needs milk all the time, was the theory. So they got to go all the way to the back of the store to get the milk and along the way they pass what? Toilet paper and coffee and all these other things. And on the way back, they pass even more. So when they went in for milk, they come back with a hundred bucks in their cart. So my question is, because I absolutely agree with you on the produce side, when are they going to move produce to the back of the store? Yeah. Yeah, I don't I, I think there's some opportunities for like uh, retail reconfigurations, some really creative, like a circular store, you know, like circuit, you know, circles, not these boring aisles. Yeah. Or do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then you put maybe you put the produce at the begin at the middle of the circle, you know. I don't know. I mean, this, out from there, yeah. there's a lot of lack of imagination in how stores are laid out. Now, maybe, maybe they, you know, have experimented and, you know, went back to basics. Who knows? But I mean, um, you know, there's opportunities to be really different in retail than, than, you know, there are much, there are many more formats that people can do, you know, like coffee, like I said, coffee inside a clothing store, you know, all these unique juxtapositions that can take advantage of, uh, of these ways people want to shop, you know. So isn't the exciting thing about that, that, um, uh, that we as consumers are really the direct beneficiary of all of this? 
I mean, really the retail chains, the, the, the omni channels, the direct to consumers at the end of the day, isn't this just a, a great experience for us? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I mean, what people are saying from my reading is that, but, you know, the internet has just given all the power to the consumer. And, you know, we have all the power. Uh, you know, we can buy anything from any channel in any way we want. And, um, you know, because of, because of information, basically, you know, we don't. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's given all, the internet has given all the power back to consumers, basically. Mm -hmm. Well, and in this, if I could ask another question, in this, this, this COVID experience we're having, I loved, you know, as you, I geeked out on your chart, and especially the time well spent, time well saved. What, what, where do you throw safety? Now, I mean, now, what, COVID, because suddenly it's about safety. I mean, I can't think of a yeah. better word to call it than safety. Where do you throw that into your quadrant and the decisions they make? Um, I haven't done too much thinking about it. I mean, I usually just use myself as the guinea pig and I ask, I look, I observe my own behavior basically and, you know, how I think about things. I, I'm, I actually have a, I'm not that worried about COVID personally. I probably should be, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, um, the people who are very concerned about it, uh, yeah, I mean, it goes right into time well saved, and that would be, you know, you could add in, um, you know, risk, time well saved, time well saved plus risk elimination is a pretty winning combo. Yeah. So, you know, if you if you figured out how to get your basic grocery and other needs met through online shopping, you've got time well saved and risk essentially risk reduction, uh, elimination, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. you don't, you know, Good. so that bottom left quadrant, you know, which in COVID times, you could say that bottom left quadrant, which is online is, it has, is expanding way out to the other quadrants yeah. because of risk reduction. Excellent. So uh, I, I, I've got another question, but I got to have Tom put up the quadrant again to do it.